Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I spent a, a few years of my life as the Vice President and Chief Economist of the United States Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is the world's largest business federation, and you all may be members, I'm not sure. And I also ran the, the National Chamber Foundation. And so it's always good to be back with chamber people. Um, but I've also been a businessman. I had built, uh, I've been an entrepreneur and built some real businesses. So I know what it's like to be a business person. I'm not just an academic or a think tank person. Um, coming down here, this is my third trip to Belize in the last, I guess, nine months, courtesy of my friend Bruce Boyd, who is an entrepreneur and loves your country. He's up in San Pedro, but he joined us this evening with his uh, friend Doug Maxwell. Um, but, you know, I come here and I was on the Cayman Island Monetary Authority board for two terms. I was the first non-Caymanian to serve as a board member. We're not getting a sound? Is it okay now? I don't like to have to talk right into it like this. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I spent a lot of, I've spent a lot of time in Cayman and I'm still on the board of the Cayman Financial Review. And as I look out, you know, across the, the beautiful seas here, and knowing that you were a former British colony as we were in the U.S., <coughs> but it made me think of Winston Churchill, who uh, I'm a great fan of Churchill's in many ways. Um, but after Churchill left the prime ministership for the last time, he decided to take a cruise because he always loved the sea. At one point, he was a uh, uh, what's the British term for Secretary of the Navy? It's uh, Lord of the Admiralty, I guess. Um, but he decided to take this cruise, and he picked an Italian liner. And some of the people in the British press were most upset about this. And a fellow from the BBC said to him, "Sir Winston." The Queen Elizabeth is a perfectly serviceable ship. Why in the world did you book passage on an Italian boat? And Sir Winston thought for a couple of moments. Then he said, well, first of all, the cuisine on an Italian liner is superb. The service is magnificent. And in case of some kind of untoward event, there's none of this nonsense about women and children first. <laughs> Anyway, it is good to be here with you today. <clears throat> uh, I guess many of you have probably t taken a look at that article I did, uh, I guess last January, when I was comparing Belize to Cayman. I'm an economist by training, and I have spent a great deal of time working with governments around the world, and have been an advisor to two U.S. presidents and the first non-communist prime minister in Russia, I chaired the Bulgarian economic transition team, and you know you've worked all over the world. I've seen this. In fact, you know what the difference between a good economist and a bad economist is? A good economist has keen observation of the real world, unlike the bad economists who live in their world of theory. But I've seen much of the world. I have a sense of what works and what doesn't. Let's go back to 1970. In that year, the per capita income here in Belize and in Cayman were pretty close. Cayman just slightly ahead. In Hong Kong, it was behind. All three of the countries were British colonies. They had the benefits of the British common law. They are all located in warm climates. Climate here in Cayman is very similar. Uh, Cayman and Belize are mixed race countries. I mean, I look at the all the various shades of complexions and national origins here. It looks much like Cayman. Same thing. Now, right now, 
Hong Kong has a higher per capita income than the U.S. on a purchasing power base, basis. Cayman is about the same, and yet Belize has per capita income about one-sixth. I'm not here to beat on Belize tonight, but I want to talk about the things that Belize can do <coughs> to bring itself up to the same level of Cayman, Hong Kong, and the United States. There is no inherent reason why Belize is not as rich as these other three jurisdictions. And Cayman, in particular, made a series of decisions, late 1960s, early 1970s, which totally changed its course. Unlike Belize, Cayman has no natural resources. It is a it's a sort of a limestone outcropping. The highest point in the country is only 56 feet. It's, uh, the soils are unsuited to agriculture. Back then it was covered with mosquitoes. It uh, doesn't have pretty mountains or Mayan runes or anything else really to attract tourists. It has one nice beach. They call it Seven Mile Beach. It's actually only five miles. <coughs> they have uh, some reefs, but nothing like yours. And so there's some good dive spots. But that's about it. And so they made a conscious decision to become a tourist and financial center. The first thing they need, at that point, they only had one little old hotel, the Galleon Hotel, which uh, served the dive trade. Um, it was an almost an impossible place to get to. But they knew they had to clean up the mosquito problem, so they brought in an Italian entomologist who figured out the nature of the Cayman mosquito and came up with an eradication plan that basically worked. Um, and then they started promoting themselves both as a tourist and financial center. They began to change the laws. They first passed a banking law to encourage banks to come in. At that point, they only had one little branch of Barclays. Uh, now they have several hundred banks, all the big multinational banks in the world have uh, many operations in Cayman. They decided to become an insurance center. Uh, Bermuda had the lock on sort of offshore ins insurance, but Bermuda made a mistake. Bermuda uh, was approached by Harvard University about uh, setting up what we call captive insurance. A lot of big companies and institutions actually own their own insurance companies. And Bermuda wasn't particularly interested in that business. So Harvard University, with all of its hospitals and medical center and everything, brought all their medical insurance to Cayman as a captive. Everybody else looked what Harvard was doing, so they said, well, if Cayman's good enough for Harvard, it's good enough for us. So virtually every major medical school in the U.S. now has a captive insurance company in Cayman. And many other companies came to Cayman. So Cayman is now the second biggest insurance place after um, Bermuda. The funds industry. Cayman had very few mutual hedge funds up into the early 1990s. And a couple Cayman lawyers from one of your competitor law firms, <laughs> Maples and Calder, <coughs> noticed that a couple uh, funds had moved from the Isle of Jersey to Cayman just under the Cayman's old standard of companies law. And over coffee one morning, I know these three individuals well, Tim Ridley, uh, and who basically did the initial law, Anton Duckworth and Tony Travers, three bright British lawyers who had moved to Cayman, started to think, what would the ideal funds law look like? So over coffee one morning, they began to draft it up. Tim did the first draft, then uh, Anton and Tony pol uh, polished it up. They took it over to the Legislative Assembly, much like your assembly here, got the thing passed, and now Cayman has more than 80% of the world's hedge funds. It is by far and away the largest jurisdiction for funds. Um, and uh, when I was on the board of the Monetary Authority, we decided to go to a step further and make Cayman very user-friendly by going totally to electronics. And if you, let's say the three of us, want to set up a fund, 
we come up with a good idea this evening. We come up with our offering document, a description of the business, and as long as it's legal, we can fill out the forms online, send them to the monetary authority in Cayman, and assuming that we're all fit and proper people, I know I am, and yeah, he is. Your president, maybe. Anyway. <laughs> Well, within 10 days, you could have your registration. Low cost, efficient. Because there is no interaction with a government official, everything is done online, there's no opportunity for bribery. Which gets me into the basic things that work in countries. I said I did a lot of work in Eastern Europe. And I am familiar with all the transition countries. I've been to all of them. And the most successful was Estonia. Why was it so successful? Well, one reason is they went to having what they call e-government. Mart Lahr was, became prime minister when he was 32 years old. The only economics book he had ever read was Milton Friedman's Free to Choose. And he said, well, it sounded good to him, so they went ahead and did it. And the other thing they did was go to basically e-government. So virtually every transaction, interaction with government officials is done over the internet. Hence, there's nobody there to put their hand out asking for the bribe. So the first thing is the rule of law. Fortunately, you have the tradition of the British common law, which gives you an enormous advantage compared to a lot of other jurisdictions around the world. But you have to have for the rule of law competent judges and attorneys and well-trained and honest. And I know there's deficiencies here in terms of the quality of some of your judges in terms of both training and perhaps their honesty. Second thing you may have to have is a strong guarantee of private property rights. In the United States, Hong Kong, Cayman, <coughs> there's no question about property rights. I know there's been recent nationalizations here. That is not a good signal to the rest of the world for foreign investors to come in if they feel something can be nationalized. The third is free markets, and that is no price controls. I don't know if you have price controls on anything here or not. I haven't really followed that much detail. But an absence of price controls because you are business people. And if the government comes in and tells you what you're going to price things at, it will end up being a disaster. In the U.S., we have price controls on our national health insurance, Medicare and Medicaid. It's a disaster. Um, every place has been tried, and I could go through the 3,000 years of human history dealing with price controls and how they've always failed. Next thing is free markets or uh, free trade, excuse me. Free trade is very important. Cayman, uh, the U.S., Hong Kong are basically largely free trade regimes, not perfect. Um, Cayman has an odd tax system because it's an island, so it has what would normally be considered a tariff. Cayman is really the equivalent of a value-added tax because there is no domestic production of any kind of goods because there's because of the small population, there's no natural resources. But basically not having barriers to trade. Now you ought to be part of NAFTA. NAFTA. You ought to have a free trade agreement with the U.S. and Mexico and Canada. Uh, that would be of great benefits to this country. Next is having low levels of government spending. Now, I noticed your GDP, your spend, government spending, the percentage of GDP is not unusually high. <clears throat> but the question is, how efficient is that government spending? Most government spending, almost any place in the world, is not efficient. In fact, we've done micro studies in the U.S., and virtually every government spending is a negative. It's a deadweight loss to the economy. And as government has gotten bigger in the U.S., economic growth has slowed. That tends to be true every place in the world. And so it's very important you not allow government to get too big. Taxation is all important, as you people know in business, and particularly taxation of capital. And there's always the tendency 
Let's go off and get those rich people. We got this big thing in the U.S., you know. But that's basically a tax on capital. Capital is very heavily taxed in most countries because you have multiple levels of taxation. You have corporate taxes, individual taxes, capital gains taxes, dividend taxes, goes on and on. And the more taxes you have in capital, the less investment you have. Capital is your seed corn. And you have to resist taxes on capital. You want taxes on consumption, what people take out of the economy, not what they put into. You don't want to have high taxes on capital and labor. You have to have reasonable regulations. And minimal regulation tends to be best. Hong Kong, low taxes, low regulation, it booms along. The U.S. used to have much lower regulations. The U.S. is being killed now by its regulations, which can be a comparative advantage for some place like Belize. But again, I was looking at the World Bank, their whole study of doing business. Uh, Belize does not rank well. According to them and other studies I've read, it's costly and time-consuming and uncertain to set up a new business here. You should be able to set up a new business over the internet in a matter of hours. In Virginia, where I live, I can go online. If I want to set up a new business, let's say I want to have a, uh, what do we have around here? I want to make a, a business to make glasses in Virginia. I want to open a little factory to do that. To set up the business, I can do it in one morning, whether it's a sole proprietorship, a limited liability company partnership, or C corporation. I go online to get my federal ID number. I have to show that nobody else has a similar name, and it's a legal business. I can fill out these forms now all electronically and be in business. And you should have that here. It shouldn't go on for months. You shouldn't be have to get somebody in government get their permission because that's always an invitation to bribery. And there's no necessity of it. Particularly small jurisdictions like Belize really ought to go to e-government. Um, <clears throat> have the problems of regulation. When I look at, again, these studies have been done by the World Bank and other credible sources about regulation, they say there's too much here. Uh, some places there's minimal regulation, but there's other places where it's used, I think, is basically a way for people and government to line their pockets. You got to get rid of that. Monetary freedom is extremely important. Um, you ought to have choice in currency. You ought to be able to make contracts in any currency you want, or in gold, or any commodities, and they should be legally enforceable in the court. <coughs> now, governments do need to have uh, defined what the legal tender is, and that can be the national currency for payment of taxes and receipt of government payments. But other things, there's no reason why you can't have freedom in currency. I was sort of... Uh, <coughs> baffled by why you have a central bank. You've got 330,000 people. That is less than one-third the number of people who reside in my county of Fairfax County, Virginia. There's no sense in you having a central bank. If you want to have your own currency, have a currency board. If you don't want to adopt the U.S. dollar, or, but have your own currency board. That's simple. It takes very few people. Um, this idea of having exchange controls is because you have a central bank. That is only an impediment to doing business. Now, maybe some of you are here from the central bank, and I've just said you should be fired. <laughs> and you're probably unhappy about this, and you're probably going to think of all kinds of reasons why Belize ought to have a central bank. Well, it ought not to. Uh, I've worked with a lot of central banks, helped set them up with currency boards from around the world. And small jurisdictions, there is, there are only an impediment. Uh, we can't run a decent monetary policy in the United States with 330 million people, let alone thinking you can run a monetary policy with 330,000 people. It's just not doable. And the only people who benefit are the people who work at the central bank, 
and it's an impediment to economic growth and everybody else in the country. So what do you do? Uh, I know how to make this place rich. If I was the economic dictator for a year, <laughs> I would guarantee you a 10% growth rate year after year after year. Actually, it's easy. We look around, we know what works, and we know what doesn't. And it's merely stripping out the impediments. And I expect every one of you who is in business has the foot of government on part of your business on your neck. They slow you down. They increase your cost. People, by their very nature, are traders and producers. And the places that get rich rapidly around the world are places where the business people are basically left alone. People are entrepreneurial. You might ask yourself, if Steve Jobs had been born in Belize, could he have set up Apple here? As easy as did. It'd be difficult these days in the US, but when he first did that 30 years ago, could that have been done? You ask yourself that question. What were the impediments? What things has the government set up? And I, I don't know anything about your political parties, and my comments are nonpartisan because I don't know who the good guys and bad guys are in your political system. But I do look at policies, and I can understand what destructive policies are. And I see it all around the globe. And um, when I was chairing the transition team in Bulgaria, they had all these regulations, and they had huge amounts of corruption. And say, they said to me, Dr. Ron, how do we get rid of the corruption? I said, get rid of the regulations. Just shut down those government departments where you had to get approvals. Just let people be people. Go to free trade. Let them do. Well, Bulgaria didn't go near as far away as I wanted to, but the per capita incomes these days are far higher. You go to Bulgaria, it's a nice country. You go along the Black Sea, it's modern, all these new hotels and office buildings and wonderful residential neighborhoods. And you go to Sofia, it's like a normal European city. Uh, 25 years ago, it was terrible, just awful under the communists. Um, those of you who've traveled in the old communist lands. I mean, we look at Cuba. Cuba used to be the richest country in the Caribbean. Now, next to Haiti, it's the poorest. It all has to do with policy. Now, some of you are going to tell me you can't do the whole country, you can't do the kind of makeover I want, um, and I think many of you would want, but you at least ought to try to set up some real free cities. You know, Nicaragua has now passed this legislation to set up free cities in Nicaragua to have the kind of policies I just talked about. Uh, Guatemala's considering them. Uh, you have came and nearby, which is equivalent of this. And this is basically having minimum taxes, minimum regulation, choice and currency, the rule of law, an honest court system. You can bring in foreign judges. In, uh, in uh, Cayman, they brought a lot of judges in from the Commonwealth country, from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. Helped train the judges there. So Cayman has a very honest court system, so people don't hesitate to make contracts in Cayman. But you need at least have an area, one of these free cities or a free zone, where you set up this kind of experiments and show the citizens how it can work and how you can have the prosperity. Belize can become rich very quickly. I mean, these turnarounds. I mean, we've got a number of countries around the world have grown at 10% per year. That means that the real incomes double every seven years. That's an enormous improvement. And you know, in a, in a generation, people can go from being poor to rich, where most citizens are. Some of you had mentioned you've recently been in China. I was first in China 30 years ago. Everybody was on bicycles. It was a terribly poor country. You go to places like Shanghai today, it's stunning. Not all of China is rich, but China now has a, a middle class, which is about 60% of the size of the middle class in the U.S. They've done all that in 30 years with the same kind of incomes. Huge number of automobiles, uh, nice homes. All that can happen here. And it's just a matter of having the political will and the leadership. 
And if the politicians won't lead, the business people have to. And um, I'm here to help. I'm happy to consult with anybody in government or with the, the, the chamber here. But I want to be able to come back in 20 years and see a very rich Belize in the way we have a rich Cayman today. Cayman did it quickly. Hong Kong did it quickly. Mainland China is doing it. South Korea, Taiwan, uh, in Africa, Botswana, Chile in Latin America. All of these places were poor and have become wealthy very quickly. You can do it. Um, with that, I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Come on, don't be shy. You all agree with everything I said? Well, what are you going to do about it? Oh, there's over there. What would you suggest, or where do you start? I mean, you spoke about uh, the central bank uh, not needing, but where do you start? There, it seems to be there are so many things that you would need to do, but <coughs> where is a good place to start? The way you do it, you start out with an agenda for growth. Chamber can do that and can say, these are the changes that need to be made here in Belize. And then what you have to do is go out there and market. Now, you people are in business. You're used to selling your goods and services. You know how to market. Politicians over the world, I don't care if it's in the U.S. or Canada or any place in Europe or any place else in the world, the politicians will always sell you out unless they think the people are with you. And so I've learned, I've worked for a number of politicians. I've worked for uh, presidents and all the way down to, you know, local members of Congress and others. And I learned not to rely on the promises politicians make because they can evaporate within months. I was an economic advisor of the first George Bush. The great line, uh, no, read my lips, no new taxes, was actually written in my living room in Great Falls, Virginia. And my former wife and I put together a lot of those speeches. Within four months of taking office, George Bush Sr. was already off the policies. Why? Because we did not actually sell the policies over and over again. Ronald Reagan understood that. He was a very unusual politician, but you can't rely on, on politicians <coughs> like him. Reagan used to say, first you've got to tell them what you're going to tell them, then you've got to tell them, then you've got to tell them what you told them, and you have to do it over and over and over again. He was a conviction politician. Margaret Thatcher was a conviction politician. Most politicians are not conviction politicians. And so you, this is your, you say, well, we don't have the leadership. Well, you've got to go out there and say to people, uh, where do you have problems? Let's say these regulations. Why can't you start a business in a matter of hours here? You can do it elsewhere. Big countries, you can small countries like Estonia, you can do it in the state of Virginia, you can do it in Estonia, you can do a lot of places in the world. Singapore, Hong Kong. Why can't you do it? You can do it quickly in Cayman. Why can't you do it in Belize? You gotta get out there and say, we should be able to do the same thing. We should be able to do all this stuff on the internet like other places do. You have the internet here. Businesses have the internet. Um, and go out there and, you know, most people are gonna say, yeah, that's a good idea. The only people who are gonna be against this are the people in these government offices who like to shuffle paper and hold things up. And, uh, I mean, it's, again, it's true over the world. Humans are, I've worked in a lot of places, humans are pretty much the same around the globe. And so you gotta take a number of these issues and say, we want change, and get up there and ridicule them, make fun of them, write nasty articles about them. Now, this is often that, you know, they say, well, you shouldn't do this. Well, of course you should. They're keeping you poor, they're keeping your fellow citizens poor, and you need to point that out. <clears throat> and it's, um, I mean, you can do it politely, but you should point it out that they're holding people down. Others, yes, sir. Obviously, from the get-go, that would be a controversial reaction between the chamber, business community, and government. Yeah. So, yeah. that's a war. 
is. Life is a war. No, I mean, no. I mean, seriously. That, that, that. You know that, that. I mean, I've been a chamber executive, and I have been in lots of wars, and even um, you have to go against the government officials. Your job is not to get along and go along with bad policies. I mean, you got out there, I mean, let's take the worst case, a tyrant. Well, you can get along perfectly well in tyrannical societies, well, you can't even get along perfectly well, by sucking up to the tyrant. But that doesn't do you good. I, I was listening to your, uh, your moving uh, national anthem. He talked about freedom and liberty. Those are great thoughts. If the government has their foot on your neck preventing you from hiring your fellow Belizeans, creating jobs, keeping your people poor in a way that is a limited form of slavery. I mean, but I've, there's a, a very famous black economist in the U.S., Walter Williams, one of our great economists, maybe many of you know him. And uh, Walter can talk in ways about this that I, I can't, given my complexion. But it is, he says, you know, he goes through, because he knew the history of American slavery. And uh, in a typical plantation, the slaves were allowed to have some little garden plots, so they, like 90% of their product <coughs> went to the master. In serfdom in Europe, in the Middle Ages, about 30% of the output went to the lord of the master. People didn't have individual freedom, neither the serfs nor the slaves. But at what point, when government so strangles you through taxation and regulation, are you no longer free? And all of us are, you know, we can't ever be totally free. In a civil society, you've got to have some regulation. You've got to have some taxation. But what point do you say enough is enough? In the modern world, fortunately, in democracies like this, you have the ballot box. We don't have to pick up the guns in the way our ancestors in the U.S. and a lot of other places had to. But you have to think about, you want your children, you want your grandchildren to be, have a prosperous life. Um, you want them to live as well as, you know, the middle class in the United States and other rich countries. And it's really up to you. I mean, again, there is no reason for, came, uh, for Belize to have an $8,000 a year per capita income and came in to have 45 or 50,000 or Hong Kong to have 45 or 50,000 or Bermuda to have 60,000. There's not any difference. I mean, there's, you people aren't inferior to them. You're all the same stuff. All our ancestors got all mixed up with it. The only thing different here is there's a set of policies that have been in place for a couple of generations that have stifled entrepreneurial activity, business activity, job creation, and economic growth. And so I call for a rebellion tonight. Not a rebellion where you pick up guns, even though us Americans like guns. No, a rebellion of words and the ballot box. And you say to your politicians, we want to be as rich as neighboring uh, Cayman, or as the U.S., or Canada. And we know how to do it. We have a problem in the judiciary system. Well, let's bring in some judges from Canada, from Australia, New Zealand, to train our judges to establish higher levels of standards. A lot of places have done this. This is not rocket science. We know what the kind of tax policies that work. We know the kind of regulatory policies that work. Why do we have this silly central bank here? Yes, sir. Could you at least philosophically make the differentiation between regulations and laws? Oh, yeah. I mean, the rule of law is you establish common rules that everybody can understand. Regulations can be good or bad. And the problem in the U.S., in a lot of places, we have all these regulations that don't just, are no longer fit cost-benefit analysis. I mean, they, they don't measure up. Let me give you an example. Let's say you've got a sports team. Um, let's say the NFL. And that if 
every before every game there was a new set of regulations that the players, the fans, and the referees had to learn, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. Pretty soon you wouldn't have the rule of law. Now, the Ten Commandments. Everybody here was taught the Ten Commandments, I bet. Your mothers all probably taught you this, right? How many can recite all of them? I know the, the preacher here can, but <laughs> I, I would bet that some of you would sort of struggle through this. Well, that's sort of human nature. Now, if you suddenly have 100,000 regulations, I mean, the U.S. tax code's got 77,000 pages. This is, you know, nobody knows what's there. We no longer have a rule of law with our U.S. tax code. And I'm saying don't get caught up in this. And you have the pressure from these international organizations, the OECD, the IMF, everybody else, want you to adapt all these international regulations. Well, you can't do it. You have stacks of them. Uh, you may, some of you who watch US TV may know John Stossel. The, uh, he's on, on Fox. And John and I did a, a program recently. We we're going to do a longer documentary in Cayman. And with all these new banking regulations, he had the stack of regulations. And they came up to about this high, higher than this table. And we talk about how these banks I've gotten too big to fail. But let's say you've got a small bank. Here in uh, Belize, you probably have a few small banks, maybe a couple dozen employees, a few more. Same thing in the U.S. We have all these small banks. For regulations, there are several feet tall. Who is going to read those? Who is going to understand them? Well, of course, it can't be done. It physically can't be done. So the banks then are forced to hire very expensive outside lawyers or accountants, but they can't afford that because they're a small bank. So they're forced to merge. So then you get bigger and bigger banking institutions who have uh, big compliance departments made up of expensive lawyers and accountants. It doesn't do anything to protect anybody, but employs a lot of these additional bureaucrats. These bureaucrats are in the private sector and they have an interest of bureaucrats in the, in the public sector creating more regulations so they get their compliance departments enlarged and it's actually like a cancer inside the business organizations. And this is a global problem. We all have to fight it. So when, it, when the people from the OECD and the IMF and all the other institutions come here and they say you ought to do this, this, and this, and you say, well, if you'd like to fund it, we'll consider it. But first get out your checkbook and don't make it a loan. That's one thing I always like to say is we'll give you a loan to do all this stuff, then you're stuck paying it back. Now one problem you've got here is your GDP debt ratio is over 80 percent. All of Western Europe is basically in this situation. I mean, who would have thought the Netherlands would have the kind of problem they had? France is well on its way to going bust is Spain and the rest. We have a situation of a global financial calamity coming upon us. We're seeing it. We saw first Greece, but all the rest are going to go. There's no way these bonds can be paid off. Just let me give you a couple of numbers about the U.S. Our gross debt is about $16 trillion, just about the same size as our GDP. Our unfunded li liabilities for Social Security and medical entitlements are $121 trillion. Now, a trillion dollars is even a big number in the U.S. And there's no way, arithmetically, you can work this out. It can be paid off. When your type of debt, 83% of your GDP, you're either going to have to grow very rapidly or renege on those bonds. There is no other alternative. With your present economic policies, you're not going to grow rapidly. So your, your choice is either to go bust like much of the rest of the world or change policies and grow rapidly. And going bust is not pleasant because what that means is that people won't buy your debt and your government, like most governments, can't live on what it now takes in. And if you try to increase taxes, you're only going to slow down economic growth more and discourage work, saving, and investment, and you'll be worse off rather than better off. Am I clear? Anyway, uh, I've, I'm sure I've gone way over my time, but I look at, I flew all the way in here to talk to you all, and so uh, I, should, I should actually get as much time as I spent on the airplanes, but they won't allow me to do that. 
But, but if you have more questions, I have uh, uh, some limited number of cards with me. I can put you on the mailing list for my weekly syndicated column. And if you give me your cards, I, just, just give me your business card if you want to be on it, if you want to hear or at least read more of this kind of, of the views of Richard Ron. But I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and my views have gotten firmer and firmer over the years because I really have lived long enough to see what works and what doesn't. And I want this place to be rich. I want to come here. It's like I want to be like we're flying in the Cayman and see a lots of big hotels, a lot of nice big new homes, and I don't want to see any poverty. Okay? Thank you all. <laughs>